The spiritual raven has always played a very prominent role in our story of creation. Even to this day, the raven has a very special significance in our lives. On the 13th of March, <clears throat> I was reminded of one of the functions of the raven, the bearer of significant news. Early on that morning, as I was leaving for my early morning walk, A raven flew overhead, calling his raven message, which I could not understand. When I returned home that morning, we listened to the radio, CBC, and the news, the very sad news, came on announcing that Bill Reed had died. It is said amongst our people, the Kwakwakwa, that when a person dies, he comes back as a whale, an eagle, a raven. Whether that's true or not, I'm not prepared to argue it. But I can tell you all that the first raven you hear will probably be Bill greeting us with his unique message for which I will be forever grateful. Au revoir. Hello, I'm Vicki Gabbaro. This program is a retrospective look at a tribute for Bill Reed that was held here at the Museum of Anthropology on the campus of the University of British Columbia. Bill Reed will be remembered not only for his artistic creations, but for the incredible number of people he influenced around the world. You see, Bill was a true genius. Everything he touched had a mark of brilliance. So it's no wonder that he's considered and compared with the masters, both past and present. Bill Reed was born on January 12, 1920, in Victoria, British Columbia. He was one of six children. His mother, Sophie Gladstone, was a Haida from Skidigat. His father, William Ronald Reed, was an American from the Detroit area. Bill spent most of his formative years in Victoria. Because his father was often away, his mother played a major role in Bill's childhood. One of the earliest lessons that Sophie instilled in him was, whatever you did, you did it well. Through his mother and his teachers, he was exposed to the arts and became a young man of cultivated and musical tastes. He couldn't afford to go to university, but his superb command of the English language and his wonderful speaking voice landed him a job as an announcer at the CBC. When he was 35, Bill joined the Provincial Museum's team on several exploratory trips 
to salvage poles from abandoned village sites on Haida Gwaii. These trips were dramatically moving experiences for him and changed his life forever. His journey to becoming Haida had truly begun. In 1958, Bill applied and was hired to reconstruct part of a Haida village at the Museum of Anthropology at the University of British Columbia. Bill immediately resigned from the CBC. The resulting carvings, through which Bill Reed essentially taught himself the craft of pole making, are now outdoor exhibits at the museum. We will have, I think, these two houses and their attendant poles when we're finished. As a matter of fact, I got a sketch here which shows pretty well what we intend to do. It's, uh, uh, as you can see, there's a big house here. This will be 40 feet square in the ground floor, and this one will be approximately 20 feet square. In the decades that followed, he went on to not only revive the art of Haida carving in wood, but also in intricate jewelry making, fine boxes, massive sculptures, and beautiful prints, creating living legends that inspire and impress everyone who sees them. For the last 30 years of his life, Bill struggled with Parkinson's disease, which in many ways makes his contribution even more significant. As much as his achievements were driven by his talent, it was through his wife Martine's own strength and love that many of his magnificent works were completed. Although it took years for Bill Reed to awake to his Haida ancestry, he was to become the single most important figure in the late 20th century renaissance of Haida culture. So it was no surprise that over a thousand people gathered here in this Museum of Anthropology on the 18th of March, 1998, to say goodbye to Bill. Their memories and their thoughts in the tribute just give us a glimpse of the legacy of this great man. Aboriginal people in this province have suffered a tremendous amount. And through that suffering, I believe had also gone through a similar awakening to our identity. At the front of that reawakening, leading the way for us Aboriginal people, way ahead was Bill Reed. Bill knew very well that we emerge out of nature, that we literally are the air, the water, the soil, and the sun. And Bill has just gone through the latest transformation along the way, and each of us will join him eventually. But before we do, we keep him alive in the memories we have of him. And as I looked at this hall filled with people, each having some part of Bill inside of them, I thought what a wonderful melange of, of memories, of insights into little bits of that complex character we all know as Bill Reed. Bill Reed was my teacher over a space of many years, my master and my friend. He understood as well as Titian and Michelangelo that it makes perfect sense for a poet to be apprenticed to a sculptor, or a painter to a poet, or a sculptor to a musician, because all the arts are one because all the arts are driven by the stories which are driven by the creatures who inhabit them. 
Those are the creatures who live in Bill's Carver. Those are the creatures to whom the earth belongs. He was left to recreate the world from scratch. And to do that, he became the master carver. By rescuing himself, he rescued others. He made it possible for all of us to wake up in a new house where the carvings wink their eyes. thing is of great importance to all to realize how important culture was to Bill. It may have been onto his life as he tried many other things and was never satisfied that he found peace, serenity, and whatever else he could in his culture. To this we are truly grateful. He's left a legacy, I've been told, by others that may never be equaled. I'm a believer of that. Bill may have passed on, but he'll never leave our mind. You know, personally, as a Northern British Columbian, I am ever grateful to Bill for his unparalleled gift to us of our own reality as British Columbians and Canadians as observed through Haida imagery. He struggled past the ability to depict in both real and mystical form our shared experience in a vision that forges bridges between people instead of putting up barriers. We honor the passing of a great artist together here today, but we also pay tribute to an exceptional human being whose works, both great and small, reflect his shining soul. Bill's generosity to us and to younger artists remains in those stately paddlers crowding the black and jade canoes, forever plying spiritual waters. And I think we can also expect successive generations of energetic young paddlers to grow in respect and understanding and trust as they paddle Luta through the real and turbulent waters of our ongoing history. Bill Reed could not have come from anywhere but here. And we are so grateful for his life and for his legacy. Someone said earlier that Bill has left a gap for us here in this province. But I tell you, he filled a tremendous gap. The gap between our peoples and you. A distance that few have been able to broach. Sometimes it's been a physical distance. Many times it's a mental distance. Bill Reed was able to bridge that gap. And it was a daunting task. And First Nations in this province thank him for that. It's from the work, the great work, of this man that I believe he set a trail for us to follow one of goodwill, one of kindness and integrity. And yes, one of true craftsmanship. I've often thought that 
amongst all the things, all the creations that Bill made, that the most significant aspect of his life in this world is reviving the spirit of the Haida and bringing honor to the Haida people and to all of us. Everyone's memory of Bill is so different according to the context and time of their friendship with him. He had the confidence in his own position to hire and work with the most skilled people he could find regardless of their race. It didn't matter who the slaves were as long as they were genuine brick allures. <laughs> I never could have imagined that anyone could arouse such a huge range of feelings in such a mass of people. I saw and felt awe, anger, envy, jealousy, compassion, rage, and exhaustion. <laughs> and I never could have imagined that one figure could create such a torrent of controversy in adulation and anger. Bill was called a trickster, a wizard, a cultural savior, a mentor, a liberal, a plaintiff, a defendant, a critic, an activist, a modernist, a maestro, an honorary doctor, a shaman, a wolf, and a haida. I probably knew Bill Reed longer <laughs> than anybody here, except Peggy. <laughs> uh, 19, uh, okay, 1938, <clears throat> towards the end of the Depression. There weren't many overweight people around. And Bill and I were not overweight. He was slender. I was skinny. <clears throat> but I somehow got <clears throat> involved in taking art lessons from Alan Edwards in Victoria. He had a little schoolhouse in the middle of a block that was right downtown Victoria. And we took evening classes where we had a live model. We were doing life drawing and Victoria had never had a life drawing class before with a live model. And the city fathers heard about this, and they could only see this giant word, orgy, <laughs> that they had to take all precautions to keep Victoria pure and sweet. So we noticed that one night we had two members of the Victoria Police Force joined the life class. And from then on, we had two members of the police force every time we had life class, but they were never the exact same policemen. <laughs> <laughs> Which we thought was rather interesting. Now, on the outskirts of this life drawing, Class, there was this slender young man. And I didn't know who he was, but I gradually found out he was Bill Reed. And then I heard that Bill Reed 
had designs on this model. And they weren't Haida designs. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. I was on the Charlottes, along with others, on a, on, a, on a trip to the Charlottes. This was when I was working on my book. And Bill pushed his way through the underbrush and this coarse, heavy grass to lead us to an interior house post that would have occupied a position in the house where of little importance, where it would not require elaborate carving but he made us all squat down and sort of get under its leaning shape. And what he wanted to point out to us was that even the back of this pool, which didn't require um, carving, had been beautifully finished and the edges smoothed. And then he, he dropped these few remarks. As somebody just said, Bill was one of the best read uh, persons one could come across. And he, he dropped these few words in the elder days of yore, and then with his wicked little glance, because he was always putting you to a test. He, you know, the challenge was to find somebody who could finish the quote and identify it. I happened, because of childhood experiences, to remember that what he was quoting was a line from Longfellow. In the elder days of yore, builders wrought with greatest care, each minute and unseen part for the gods see everywhere. As we all know very well, Bill was a brilliant and poetic wordsmith. But in the long run, he will be remembered for the things, the objects he made. I've never met anybody that loved the public as much as Bill. There were times I'd be carving, and he'd come and talk to me and order me around a little bit. And then he would have a little nap. And this was on Granville Island. and. Uh, before you know it, lunchtime comes and Bill stirs awake and his entourage arrives and away they'd go for lunch and he was just totally energized by the love that people gave him and I think he gave a lot back. Uh, I admired him for that. I remember one day uh, he came back from lunch quite late and uh, there was a group of old ladies with him. They would bought him whatever and they were just ooing and aahing over the great Bill Reed. And uh, he's standing by the window, and I had to ask him something. So I'm standing beside him, and he's like this. And I said, uh, friends of yours, Bill? Nope, never met him before today. <laughs> I said, uh, well, what were their names? He says, that's not important. Just think of them as really nice people with extraordinarily good taste in art. <laughs> now, I was... I was privileged to visit Bill many times in his home, but I have to tell you, he always intimidated the hell out of me. So I was very nervous about talking to him, and he, as Brian alluded, he had a, a wicked sense of humor, and I, I could never figure out whether he was being mischievous or serious. I remember once he said, why don't you organize a, a demonstration about all the clear-cut logging in Caresdale? And I thought at first that he was making fun of me, but I realized that he was serious, that it really bothered him that we have an urban forest. And what we were doing to the urban forest was a critical issue as well. My memories of, of Bill, of course, are of a man terribly slowed by disease, but 
always when we'd call him up and say, hey, Bill, you want to come over for dinner? He'd be ready for it every time. And he'd come over and in that special car and come up and we'd all pull him up into the room and he'd, he'd sit down to dinner and, and a few minutes after we got started, he'd say, I have, to, I have to lie down. And he'd just go down on the floor, stiff as a board, and we'd all carry on without him. And then eventually he'd get up and come back and, and join us because he just loved to be with people and to have a party. And, and he, he tried very hard not to let his body uh, be, uh, hold him back. I, really uh, I too found Bill somewhat intimidating. Uh, and that search for perfection combined with a delicious sense of humor uh, was enough to keep one on edge. And early on, I, I went to have lunch with Bill uh, on Granville Island, as I recall. Uh, and you never knew with Bill quite, quite what lunch would bring. It, it was kind of a command performance and a wonderful one. Usually there were surprises. More than once I cut my finger trying to do something on boxwood. Um, I made the mistake once of complimenting him on the luster of the black canoe to have him tell me, of course, it was only kiwi black shoe polish. <laughs> uh, but at this lunch, at one point in the middle of it, as conversation unfolded, Bill had a, had a theory about the origination of the ovoid form in, in Northwest Coast art, and that it in fact came from the shape of a canoe. If, if you bent the canoe uh, at bow and stern and laid an upside down canoe over the other, you had that ovoid form, which really became the basis of so much of this art. And, and here was a man who, who was, was shaking, his, his hand was shaking, uh, he seemed to be in pain, but he picked up a ballpoint pen and on the back of a paper napkin began sketching his theory of, of uh, the metamorphosis of Haida art. And these magic forms began appearing one after another. And in these ovoids, which had begun as canoes, there was a kind of a cosmology, a whole world erupted that I didn't understand or certainly did not understand then and ovoid after ovoid was filled with forms, just sketched, just a few, a few lines from a ballpoint pen, but in that hour, a world came alive, and, and certainly I learned to see things in a different way. As the lunch went on, of course, Bill had a penchant for adding parts when he was doing things, and I know that there was probably a pretty good party going on in at least one of those ovoids before, before the lunch was over but there was a magic sense of, of, uh, of a different world and the kind of world that, that he put himself in. Well, Bill, it is said that you didn't suffer fools lightly. Well, I must almost have gone that route. It was in 1980. My wife and I were planning our new house, and you offered to carve the door for it. I made a remark that it was important that the door be ready on time, and that delay could not be tolerated. <laughs> Jim Hart and you worked very hard to produce a wonderful door delivered many weeks in advance with your comments, you Swiss are not the only ones that are efficient. Touché, Bill, touché. When Bill and Martine first came to my studio in 79 and asked me to work on the Raven piece, I was so excited to be able to contribute to his legacy. Bill was at the peak of his mastery, his only instruction was, don't look at the model, make it feel like a clamshell, and oh, by the way, if the balls are in the wrong place, feel free to change them. <laughs> An interpretation would mean carve the anatomy, but keep it high that. Then he disappeared for three days while I contemplated how Canada would treat me if I destroyed the piece. <laughs> but then Bill arrived like a movie star in a gray Rolls Royce, wearing a white shirt and sunglasses, complaining bitterly about all his social obligations. He was like nothing I had ever encountered before, a true mentor with the conviction of the priest from my Catholic childhood. He would ridicule the church while praising the raven's cunning skill in bringing light to the world. He was humored by people who were searching for their inner self, knowing that you construct yourself by what you do and make. He needed his art, writing, and storytelling to survive, to keep his mind off his Parkinson's. His enthusiasm for his work, in spite of his daily, hourly, minute-by-minute -minute pain, is his greatest achievement. We younger people complain about our aches and pains, but we can only imagine from the pain on Bill's face what he went through in the later years for the joy of creating.
From the beginning, whatever he did, he was a master craftsman, whether an announcer, whether a teacher, a writer, a jeweler, a carver. And that's what gave him his uniqueness, his meticulousness, his focus. And through his work, he gave us a different insight into art, whether it was in the native tradition or the cutting edge of the contemporary, because he dwelt in both worlds, showing us that excellence, the most taxing of all demands, when achieved, transcends the limitations of place, time, and culture. By witnessing his native heritage, discerning it, but not completely surrendering to it, building on his Western training, but not dependent on it. He bridged both and brought to his work the immediacy and pertinence of the eternal present, no matter how ancient his sources. His presence here in this building will all be there for us. In the guy turning his back on the shell of the raven, taking one look out and saying, I've had enough. When given the sight of a gun turret for his peace, the very image of war, he deified it by putting on it the Haida myth of creation. He is the reluctant conscript in his parody of the political game, the chief mimicking in a way Washington crossing the Delaware, impervious to the quarreling animals around him. What raven mischief he engendered, what pleasure he gave us, and what inspiration we will always be thankful for his great contribution. It's indescribable, I believe, the feeling that you have when you first come into this room. And it's difficult to embrace the history that must be represented by these poles and the story about how some of them got here. And when I looked into that history, you will find, as I did, Bill Reed. One might wonder why these poles should have been removed from their original location. But when I walked into this room, and I slept on this ledge here for two nights in the midst of these beautiful carvings. They came alive for me. They speak to you if you listen. Bill Reed hasn't really passed away. He's gone home. And in our belief, 
He's going to return. Someone will step in to his shoes. I can say that I lived a better life because Bill Reed was here. He was many things to me. He was an elder, although it's sometimes hard to think of Bill as an elder. We did so many things together. He was my mentor. He was my advisor. He was my confidant. But I think most of all, Bill was my friend, and I know many of you feel that. You know that our people, our nation, the Haida Nation, were a proud people. Bill often, Bill always, made us proud. Very often he made us madder in hell too. But he always made us proud. And I know that all people who shared and know of Bill feel the same. Bill Reed leaves an awesome legacy that's been talked about so much Tonight, he lived life to the fullest. Even when he was racked by to the diseases that he had, he wrung every ounce of life out of that body of his, and he enjoyed it right up until the end. And it's so beautiful to see, to, to witness. And when people look back at what Bill Reed is about, they'll remember the high standards with which he did things. You might think that Bill is going up to Queen Charlotte Islands, but I have my own version of that, and I can do that because this is a democracy. <laughs> I believe he's up in that great studio workshop in the sky. That's my personal belief. And this is a great workshop with every creative person that's ever been in the world up there. It goes for trillions of miles in all directions. And I know that Bill's up there working. And I know that in a few years, I'm going to be up there, too. <laughs> I may not be in his corner. I might be over there somewhere. But I know that every two or three years, our, <laughs> our paths are going to cross, and we're going to go on for eternity.
we came from different cultures. We came from different parts of the world. And we spoke different languages. But we had one common interest, the love for small things. Things well made, the making of jewelry. Bill had just returned from Toronto where he had completed his goldsmith training. The year was 1957. Bill was still with the CBC, but jewelry and goldsmithing was his passion. And he had discovered his rich Haida heritage. I, at the time, had the technical know-how. Bill had the design, the vision, the courage and the long-lasting and very fruitful exchange between Bill and myself began. Bill taught me that perfection was not all. In order for a piece of jewelry to become more than just an adornment, it needed design, imagination, and yes, it needed courage. How much of Bill's genius rubbed off on me, I do not know. I do, however, know that the many years that I've had the opportunity to meet him have had an enormous influence in my life and also in my work. Bill directed me to make the ancient reluctant conscript, the lowly human paddler on his last large project, any way I wanted. This was the only non-deity on board, the slave. In the Renaissance tradition of maestral and tradesmen, I was given the clear mandate to do my best to resolve this minor support figure. When I sculpted it into an obvious portrait, hide a portrait of Bill himself, he was furious with me and chopped up the face with his small ads. But the inertia of the form gave way. When repaired, it still felt like Bill, and appropriately so, as he was a slave to his own visions, the consummate practitioner of the well-made object. Over the 11-year span and 15 projects I worked on for Bill, there were many times he was furious with me, and I was fed up with him. But I was determined to continue knowing his universal goal was greater than any tension in the studio, which was as real as the tension he strove for on the surfaces of his work. Regardless how pressing the deadlines were and how serious the legal and technical problems were, he would rarely reveal his next move. Like the raven reassembling stolen silver in his nest, he would play with the follies of human nature, its quest for power, and with Murphy's Law, the principle that materials possess their own uncooperative nature. He was a compulsive manipulator of materials, an alchemist of culture, an advocate of visceral work as a means of communication in itself, a view of the world which he felt was on the edge of extinction. My association with Bill, like George, I think we were the worst kept secrets in this business. Bill had help and he needed help and we were there. Uh, never bothered me a bit. Uh, he paid well. Nothing I ever did for Bill belonged to me. In fact, we argued quite often over the direction a piece was taking, and uh, he would always say, it's my piece. Who's paying you? And that was how it was always settled. Um, I bring this up because I ran into Robert the other day, and uh, he said, it's good that you took credit for that staff, you know? And I said, you know, I got a confession to make. I never told Bill this. And everybody thinks it's a big secret that I worked on this thing for Bill, but I never told Bill that I, I didn't have enough time to finish it, so I subcontracted it. <laughs> How's that for irony? So Doug Zilke, if there's any way, shape, or form you can see this, uh, if you've been acknowledged. Robert told me, don't worry about it. We'll clean it up at your eulogy. But I thought I'd let him off the hook. Robert, you don't have to outlive me now. Um, interesting thing. Uh, Bill was with me all the time in, in terms of my evol evolution as an artist. And, and I mentioned that we argued all the time over commissions and the directions they took if I was involved. And, and um, what finally made me leave, I suppose, was, was Bill himself. Uh, I, one of the stipulations I had was, if I'm going to work with you, I get to pick your brain whenever I want. So in keeping with that, I used to bring him things I was working on, and I brought this Repose bracelet in one day. And he looked at it, and he said, ah, oh, it's beautiful. What a waste. I said, excuse me? 
He says, uh, why are you wasting your time in silver? You should be carving gold. And I just went ballistic. I said, Bill, look, I'm not Bill Reed. I can't lay out four grand on gold and sit there and wait till it sells. And he just smiled at me. And I, I went on and off for a while, told him all my, my bills. Uh, we had a newborn son. My daughter was two. And Bill just smiled and smiled. And uh, finally, I got tired of talking. And he just looked at me. And he said, uh, you know what your problem is, kid? You're too damn practical. So that was the end of the conversation. I left. I was really upset. I went home and told my wife, and uh, she stayed away from me. Um, this was Friday afternoon. Saturday, I wouldn't talk to her. Sunday, I was coming down a little bit. But Sunday night, I realized, he's right. The only reason I'm here is because I'm scared to do it on my own. I thought I needed his money and his direction to pay for my freedom. I would work on my own stuff at night, but it wasn't enough anymore. So I started working on something that I wanted to do. So Monday comes along, and I'm very involved in this thing. Tuesday rolls along. Wednesday, I get a call. It's Bill. When are you coming in? I said, well, I'm not. Uh, I decided to take your advice and not be so practical. And he says to me, well, couldn't you start that next week? <laughs> And, but he accepted it. I told him my reasons, and it, he never argued with me. He just said, don't be a stranger. Come around sometime. So I could have learned, you know, a heck of a lot more from Bill, but I, I called it and decided to go on my own way. Like I said, I had to stay away from him. I didn't, uh, didn't, I didn't want to do that. So I'd get near him, and he'd suck me up in his quest, his plans, dreams of great works. It was great times to talk about them. But for me, it was impossible. I was already heavily into my own work. So it was always kind of a, my downfall. I had great times with Bill, and I cherished him very much. I also cherished what he's done for us as a people. He's held us up there. He introduced me into other art forms other than Haida. For a lot of, lot of years in my life, I thought Haida was the only art in the world, and that's all there was. But slowly, I started learning there was others. Bill was great in there with all the greats. After I realized that, it was appreciate them even more. In many rights, Bill Reed is a chief. He was our chief carver, chief artist. Thank you, Bill, for the trails that you broke for all of us. You have expanded the art beyond Haida boundaries. How a kill slide. How are Kiskulans? How are Iljuas? A forest doesn't die when the old trees die. A forest dies when the young trees die. And Bill has given all of us, Haida, everyone, all of you that come here to, to share this evening, so much insight, so much wisdom through his doing, and so much strength through his example. And now he's removed his shadow, that canopy which he raised so high in understanding and respect is gone now. And that light of responsibility is with us that are still here. And I feel so excited. I feel so good, optimistic about the future when I listen to Robert Davidson, when I listen to Don Yeomans, when I listen to Jim Hart and all of people, Haida and non-Haida, who spoke tonight. We have such huge challenges 
in front of us, but we have so much to address it with. And one thing I'll say, one thing that Bill taught me, our peoples are going through a period of reconciling. Not forget that the Haidas don't exist or the Quagios don't exist and all these other people we do. Canada exists and British Columbia and we must learn to get along together. And Bill understood this. And I think his masterpiece, to me that's what it will always be, his masterpiece, the spirit of Haida Gwaii sitting in the embassy in Washington and at the airport is going to be a bright beacon of human beings and the realities they face, the living up to our own potential and the need to pull together if we really want to get anywhere. Because when we really look at it, we're all in the same canoe. I know in times when I would get angry and impatient with politics and this, these issues of getting along with other people, I always listened when Bill said, and I will always remember, he'd say, buddy, you remember in its most fundamental sense, Haida means human being. All I can say is, is, Hawa, kill sly. Hawa. We wish you peace on your new journey. We'll be okay. The art can't stand still. We're losing our last connections with the past. It would be ridiculous to think of people repeating the things that I am doing now or that, or in 20 years repeating the things that Robert Davidson has been doing or after that, whoever comes after him. Uh, I think there has to be, sooner or later, uh, probably a complete break with the legendary paths we know it. So out of this may come something which may make some permanent contribution to the general uh, area, the arts. Bill's final journey to Tenu on Haida Gwaii, which persists on maps as the Queen Charlotte Islands, took place in July 1998. Bill believed that the Haida canoe was the most beautifully designed craft in the world, so it was fitting that his ashes were carried back to Haida Gwaii in Lutas, the canoe he had personally carved. After a memorial feast in Bill's honor was held in Skidigat, the ceremony moved on to Tenu, the birth village of his grandmother. Upon arriving at Tenu, a procession of family and Haida peoples took Bill's ashes to the grave site. Some were scattered in the forest and the rest were buried. Inscribed on his modest rectangular headstone are carved Bill's two Haida names, Iljuas and Yalth Squangsang. Through his carvings, jewelry, books and drawings, and his interviews, Bill compelled the world to recognize his forebearers' art and culture. Bill Reed helped restore the idea of pride in the Haida Nation. Perhaps that's his greatest legacy. I'm Vicki Gabriel. Oh, yeah.